Now that we have a partial answer to our second question, when are two groups equal? Let's use isomorphism to return to our first question, constructing new groups from old groups. We consider a new type of isomorphism. So we'll consider isomorphisms that carry a group back to itself. So definition, an automorphism of our group G is an isomorphism pi carrying our group back to itself. Recall, for isomorphism, we have two features. First, pi is a bijection, so one to one onto. So that means pi gives us an equivalence of sets. Then we have pi as a homomorphism. So that means pi preserves the multiplication. So pi of xy equals pi of x times pi of y. So it doesn't matter if we multiply before or after we apply pi. Now, another definition, we'll call aught g the set of all automorphisms of g. So all isomorphisms that carry g back to itself. To get a new group from an old group, we can consider aught g. So aught g is a group under composition of mappings. Now, because of this result, we have that aught g is a subgroup inside a larger group of all bijections from g to itself. So let's show aught g is a group. Now, we have our four properties. So first, close under multiplication. So we assume we have two automorphisms, pi one and pi two. Okay, both go from g to g. Take their composition, so pi two composed of pi one. We saw last time a composition of isomorphisms is another isomorphism. So pi two composed of pi one, it's gonna be an automorphism of G. Second property, associativity. This follows immediately from composition of functions. So that we inherit from the bijections from G to G. For the identity element, we consider the identity map. So that's gonna go from G to G. We're just gonna send each element X to itself. We saw last time, that's an isomorphism. Finally, inverses. If we have pi and automorphism in G, so we have an isomorphism pi going G to itself. Because we have a bijection, we can consider the inverse map. And we saw last time that this inverse map, okay, it's automatically a bijection. Last time we showed it's also a homomorphism. So that means pi inverse is gonna be an automorphism. So that means aught g is a group. For basic examples, we'll start with z mod three under addition. Because we have a homomorphism, the identity elements carry to itself, so zero goes to zero. The elements that we're left with we have two elements of order two, so we can either leave them alone or switch. Now, straightforward to show that these are homomorphisms, but let's note, I can write both of these in the form pi k of x is equal to k times x. So here, if we apply pi sub two to two, I have two times two is four, subtract off a three and I get a one. So this checks out. Now, this means Automorphism group of Z mod three is isomorphic to Z mod two. So we have the identity element and an element of order two. So let's check that. So if we apply pi two twice, we switch one and two, switch one and two again, and then we're left with what the identity element does. So that checks out. Let's look at Z mod four under addition. Same idea, zero goes to zero. We look at the orders. I have a unique element of order two. Order is preserved under isomorphism, so that element must be sent to itself. So two goes to two. Our options are either to leave one and three alone or to switch. Now, it's straightforward to check that these are both homomorphisms, but again, we'll note, we could write these both in the form pi sub k of x equal to k times x, Let's check it with this one. So if I take three times two, I get six, I subtract four, we get two. We apply pi three to three, 
we get 9, we subtract 8, we get 1. So that checks out. Finally, we note pi sub 3 has order 2. So we're just doing a double switch again. Now, this formula here is the beginning of the automorphism group for modular integers, but we're going to save that for another talk, maybe two. Let's try an infinite example. So how about the integers under addition? Now, our approach is going to be the integers are cyclic, so if I have an isomorphism, a generator has to be sent to another generator. That means everything's determined by where 1 goes, and it has to go to either plus or minus 1, the only generators in the integers. That means we have either pi of x goes to x, or pi of x going to minus x. So we have our identity element, and we have an element of order 2. If I multiply by minus 1, and then minus 1 again, we get back to the identity. So the automorphism group of z is just z mod 2. Now, shifting gears a little bit, let's consider a special class of automorphisms. So these are called inner automorphisms. So if I fix some x in our group, we'll define c of x going from our group to itself by c sub x of g equals x g x inverse. So we're conjugating by x. Now, this is an automorphism, so we have to show that we have homomorphism and bijection. Now, for homomorphism, we'll just calculate our homomorphism on g times h in two different ways. So in the first way, we apply cx to gh, and we get x, gh, x inverse. Doing it separately, we have x, g, x inverse, x, h, x inverse, and the x inverse x cancels in the middle to give us x gh x inverse. So homomorphism. Now, to show that each c sub x is a bijection, we'll just produce the inverse map for each cx. So we fix a cx going from g to g. Claim is that the inverse map of cx is just c of the group element x inverse. So we'll apply cx to cx inverse of g. So we're going to have x inverse g, x inverse inverse, which is just x. And if we apply cx, we're going to have x, our item from before, and x inverse. So the x's cancel in pairs, and we're left with g, which I can rewrite as the identity element okay, for functions, capital I, on g. So it sends each element to itself. That gives one direction. If we reverse the order, we'll get the same answer. So that's our assertion, and each CX is a bijection. So automorphism. Now, if we collect all these inner automorphisms, we'll just denote this set N of G. Claim N of G is a normal subgroup of aught G. So, First, we'll show subgroup, and then we'll show normal. For subgroup, we want to show closed under multiplication. We'll show that we have an identity element in there to show that we're non empty, and then we'll show closed under inverses. So if we take two elements, okay, in NG, CX and CY, we want to show that CX times CY is also an NG. So that means I want to write CX times CY as C of another element. Okay, the obvious choice is x times y. So let's check. If we take cxy on g, okay, we're going to conjugate by xy, so xyg, xy inverse. By a rule for inverse of a product, switch the order, put inverses on. So I have y inverse, x inverse. Then on the inside, we have c of y applied to g. Now, this, in turn, is just c of x applied to cy of g, and that's what we want. cx, cy can be rewritten as c of xy, which is an inner automorphism. For the identity element, I note that our identity map is just given by conjugation by the identity element. So if we apply c sub e to any g, we have e, g, e inverse, 
e inverse is equal to e. If we multiply anything by e, we do nothing. So we get back g, and that's equal to the identity map. For closed under inversion, we've already done all the work. We've seen that the inverse function to c of x is just c sub x inverse. So the inverse function for c sub x is again an inner automorphism. So that shows we have subgroup. For the normal property, we just write out our definitions and then things take care of themselves. So for all pi and all g, all c sub x and n g, pi c sub x pi inverse, conjugation by pi, is also in n g. The punchline is gonna be that this is equal to c sub pi of x, so it's another inner automorphism, and that's what we want. Now, let's take this, apply it to the element g, and see where it goes. I don't know what pi is, so I just leave pi inverse g alone. We apply c sub x, so we'll have x pi inverse g, x inverse, and we apply pi. Pi is a homomorphism, so we apply it to each item in the parentheses. So we have pi of x, pi, pi inverse of g, and pi of x inverse. Now in the middle, pi, pi inverse of g, this is just gonna turn into g because we have pi, pi inverse. Then for pi of x inverse, I could pull the inverse to the outside by the homomorphism property. So we're left with pi x, g, pi x inverse, also known as c sub pi x of g. So that's our result. One more general result for n of g. As a group, in g, it's isomorphic to g modulo the center of g. This is just gonna follow from our isomorphism theorem. If we have some onto homomorphism from g to h, then we have that h is isomorphic to the quotient group g mod the kernel of pi. So, what we need is to show that we have an onto homomorphism, and then we need to calculate the kernel. Now, our map is, okay, we'll just call it C. We're sending each element of the group to an inner automorphism. So this is gonna be onto by definition, okay? All of these inner automorphisms are written as C sub x. So I'll call C evaluated x or C sub x just because we don't want this normally, otherwise we get a piling up of variables after the C. So this is just for here. Now, for the homomorphism property, we want to show that C of xy equals C of x times C of y. We've already shown this, this is just the homomorphism property that C sub xy equals C sub x, C sub y. So that's taken care of. For the kernel, so, we're considering all x in the group such that if we apply c to x, we get the identity mapping out. Now, let's unravel what this says. For this to be the identity mapping, it says if we apply this to any y, we get y back for any y in the group. If I rewrite this, we have xy x inverse equals y, and if I push the x inverse to the other side, we have xy equals y inverse. This is just gonna be the definition of the center of G. So, by our isomorphism theorem, we have our result here. For a final definition, we have out G, the group of outer automorphisms of G. This is just the quotient group out G by NG. We can think of out G as being the genuine automorphisms of G. So, what this means we're considering all automorphisms modded out by those that come from within the group, so generated by elements in the group. Now, let's look at some examples with our past few results. If we assume G is abelian, G is equal to its center, so the inner automorphism group is isomorphic to G mod ZG, or the one element group. So the only thing in here is the identity map. We can see this directly if I apply any c of x to g, we get xgx inverse, 
because we're abelian, we could push the x inverse to the x, and we're left with the g. So that means we have the identity map for all c sub x. That raises the question, given a group, must there be a non-trivial automorphism? The answer is yes, but we need to answer in a few cases. Now, if our group is not abelian, then we have an easy answer. There's going to be some inner automorphism C sub x that's non-trivial. So somewhere in our group, we could find an x and a y with x, y not equal to y, x. Then we have x, y, x inverse is not equal to y. So C sub x is not the identity map. If we're abelian, then we have to pay attention to elements of order two. So we'll have two cases. In the first case, we assume that there's some element in the group, such that x squared is not the identity element. Then I can use this automorphism here. So I'm going to send each element g to its inverse. Now, to show that this pi is an automorphism, First, we have a bijection. So if I apply this twice, okay, we're going to take g inverse inverse, but we know that's equal to g. So we have the identity map. So we have the inverse function is the map itself. So bijection. For the homomorphism property, we need abelian. So if we apply pi to gh, I get gh inverse. By our inverse of a product rule, we reverse the order, put the inverses on. So I have h inverse g inverse. Then because we're abelian, we have g inverse h inverse. Just switch the order. So that's pi of g, pi of h. So homomorphism. Now, the only way that this could be trivial would be if every element had g equal to g inverse or g squared equal to the identity. So order one or two. So we're ruling it out with this first case, which leaves us in the second case and for here, we'll just assume our groups are finite, just so we're not bringing up groups we haven't discussed before. Now, last time we noted, if we had this property, then we could write G as okay, isomorphic to a product of Z2s. Now, if I have a product of Z2s, our group G is going to have additional structure. It's actually going to be a vector space over Z mod 2. So we're moving into some linear algebra now. Next thing we note, if we have okay, an isomorphism from G back to itself, then we can think of that in terms of linear algebra as inducing an invertible linear transformation. So that's going to bring in matrix groups. Now, with G in this form, if we have an isomorphism pi from G back into G, pi is a bijection and pi has the homomorphism property. If we think in terms of vector spaces over Z2, where we have the usual action of Z2 on vectors, then the homomorphism property is just the condition that pi is a linear transformation. That pi is bijective just says that this linear transformation is invertible. So if we choose a basis, then Aut G is isomorphic to GLN Z2, the set of n by n matrices with entries in Z2 with the determinant not equal to zero. And here n refers to the number of factors. Here, the multiplication is given by matrix multiplication. So the punchline here is, if we have a group of this form with more than one factor of Z2, we're going to have many automorphisms. We also have, because G is abelian, aut G is isomorphic to alt G. Now, to look at a specific example, let's consider aut of Z2 cross Z2. This group generated by two elements, so let's go with 1, 0, and 0, 1. If we have an automorphism. We need only tell where it sends these two elements, and then the rest is determined. Now, we have three choices of element of order two to send one, zero, two. 
With that, we'll only have two elements for where we can send 0, 1. So we have at most six automorphisms. Now, for any of the choices that we make here, we in fact get an automorphism. So the automorphism group has six elements. Now, we know that there are only two isomorphism classes for groups with six elements. Z mod 6 if you're abelian, S3 if your group's non-abelian. So I'm going to take two automorphisms, pi 3 and pi 1. Okay, they both send 0, 0 to 0, 0. And we check that pi 3, pi 1 is not equal to pi 1, pi 3. So not abelian, which means odd of G is isomorphic to S3. As a rule, we should never be content to just have the isomorphism class. When we have two specific groups, we'll want to construct the explicit isomorphism. That might reveal more features of the group that we hadn't seen before. Now, in the case we have here, okay, for Z2 cross Z2, we'll just choose the standard basis, so 1, 0, and 0, 1. We'll show that this is isomorphic to S3. Now, when I consider these elements as vectors being acted on by a matrix, I'm going to treat them as column vectors. Then our scheme for the isomorphism is going to be, I'm going to label each of these vectors with a 1, 2, or 3. And when we apply one of these matrices, it's just going to permute these vectors around, so it's going to permute the 1, 2, and 3. That's how we'll get our elements of S3. One thing that's interesting to check, okay, we have orders of elements. Okay, they're clear on the right-hand side, but you should take powers and matrices just to convince yourself that these all line up. Now, things we would need to check. First, for instance, if we take this matrix here, 1, 1, 1, 0, Let's see that that actually goes to the three cycle one, three, two. So we do our matrix multiplication against the vector. So one's going to go to three, two goes to one, three goes to two. So I have one, three, two. We'd also have to show that this assignment here gives a homomorphism. So we want to check all multiplications in the following form. So for instance, if I took okay, the 1 for 1, 2, the 1 for 1, 3, we multiply, expect to get the matrix for 1, 3, 2. And that'll work out. Now, this is Z2 cross Z2. How about Z2 cross Z2 cross Z2? There's a big jump there. So where we have six elements when there's two factors, we'll have 168 elements when there's three factors. Well, that seems like a large group compared to what we've been working with. But for the basics, that group lends itself nicely to tricks from linear algebra. As a final example, let's consider okay, the automorphism group of S3, which will be equal to the inner automorphisms of S3, which is isomorphic to S3. Now, for the inner automorphisms, Okay, this is going to be equivalent to S3 by the center of S3. So the center of S3 is just the identity element. So we have the inner automorphism group is isomorphic to S3 itself. Now, note S3 is generated by the elements 1, 2, and 1, 3. We have three elements of order 2. So if we consider all possible bijections that send elements of order 2 to elements of order 2, there are three places where we can send 1, 2. There are two places where we can send 1, 3 once we've made this choice. So we have, at most, six automorphisms. Now, we've already seen, though, we have six inner automorphisms. So that's going to be an equality. We're going to have exactly six elements in aught of S3. So this holds up.